Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for October 13th, 2020. I am Joe Lynch. This is the City Council Update with President Matt McLaughlin. And it is my pleasure to welcome for her first appearance on Media Center Live, City Councilor at Large, Kristen Strezzo. Good Hi. afternoon to you both. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor McLaughlin, you're an old hand at this. Let me say hi to Kristen Strezzo and ask her how Please she's do. doing these days. How am I doing? I, I'm doing okay, thanks. Uh, rolling, rolling with uh, our current climate and doing the best I can. Thanks for asking. And, and you did say that, you know, we may have a guest appearance. <laughs> I, know you, I know you have two little ones at home, but don't worry about a thing. Thank you, yes, there is a seven-year-old and a 11 and a half year old roaming the apartment in, in school. Right well, let's go right, right back over to Matt McLaughlin. Matt, the COVID update, do you have anything on the numbers? I know that we were recently put into the yellow zone, um, but it appears as though we're holding stable. Yes, we're holding stable, uh, but there are places like Boston uh, that are teetering close to red now. Um, so there, nothing happens in a vacuum here. Again, we've talked about this before that the disease doesn't know uh, city boundaries. So if other areas around us are increasing, we should be careful. And you know, the city is still holding off on uh, the second phase of phase three uh, for these reasons to make sure that uh, we're, we're keeping in control of the COVID situation. So as always, the message is always the same is you know, wash your hands, don't touch your face, stay six feet away from people. Please wear a mask when you're around other people and we just got to hold tight and uh, keep doing what we're doing. I also wanted to put out uh, that the city is starting their Resistat, which is going to be remote this year. Uh, so this will be the first time that Resistat is remote. And if people want uh, to, and it's going to be subject based instead of based on wards. So if people are interested in attending Resistat, there's actually one, I believe, this Thursday. And you can go on the city's website at someofLMA.gov and click on the coronavirus link and you can learn more there. But inquiring minds want to know, Matt, um, what happens to that pizza? How are we going to do pizza virtually? I don't know. I think we can have uh, everyone get a slice from Peenies. <laughs> we'll deliver a slice for every person who attends. There you go. Give your address. There you go. Matt, thank you so much. Kristen, I want to go over to you for one second, and then we can continue the conversation with, with Councilor McLaughlin. I noticed on one of the three major Boston stations that you were attending a rally this past weekend uh, with some other elected officials. And it covers the eviction moratorium uh, that Governor Baker imposed early in the COVID pandemic. And that expiration date is coming up, I believe it is Saturday. So if you want to do a quick update on uh, what the rally was intended to do and what Governor Baker is now announcing uh, as of today. Well, as of today? Well, well, the rally was, was put together by several community partners, uh, by CAS, and also, um, and also SEC, and um, housing advocates in the community because we're at a breaking point. The eviction moratorium expires uh, as of Saturday. We have so many residents and families in our community in Somerville holding on to all they can. We know that, uh, that families are, some families haven't had income since March, since the beginning of shutdown, have applied and applied and applied or, or doing as much as they can looking for work but also applying for rental assistance and and so with the moratorium expiring we know that uh, families uh, will be either uh, eviction court will be will be slammed and and first off we'll also be having families where as of a couple months ago 67 percent of those uh, that are having eviction um, or facing evictions have children, their households with children residing in them, 67%. That might be more as of October, but we know that this is going to be not only just a devastating social crisis, uh, a social justice crisis, but also a health crisis because it means that families will be forced as we go into colder seasons to be living in cars, 
to be doubling up and tripling up with other families and, and residents in the community. What will that do for a COVID response? We also know that what will it do for the families, both the economic, but also the emotional and the physical, the, the health of, of our community and those families involved. This involves us all. I could go on a full half an hour about this. Um, I will restrain myself. I am very concerned. I don't even think we're doing enough. What I do know above everything is that this is a crisis that was, was happening way before COVID and that we just have a spotlight on it. We have some decisions and we need to make bold, positive decisions to help our community. And I don't think we're there yet. Thanks, Kristen. I want to try to frame it so people understand the magnitude of what we're facing. Um, if somebody doesn't have enough money to pay their rent, the landlord can take them to court and evict them. And there are protections that are out there. If a landlord doesn't have enough money to pay their mortgage, the bank can take action against them. We are in the middle of a global pandemic and the CDC has said to, to eliminate those possibilities of people losing their housing, property owners losing their property. The federal government really needs to step in and do something about this. And quite frankly, I think the federal government is absent, which they've, they've kind of uh, abdicated their responsibility on this and given it over to the states. And that's kind of where I wanted to pick up with Governor Baker. Um, Governor Baker announcing that he is creating a fund. I believe what I saw this morning is $171 million. And it is to ease the burden on some of those tenants um, and some of those property owners um, and, from and Saturday I, on. And I do, I do want to jump into that. And, and thank you for mentioning that this isn't just tenants as well. This is small landlords and this is homeowners as well. And it's, it's an absolute, I hate the phrase, phrase trickle down, but it is, it's, it's affecting so many different uh, categories uh, of, of of our society and, and yes it is small landlords it is landlords too and i want i want emphasis on that too uh and, and you're right there's an absolute absence of leadership at a federal level and i could go on about this but it's very clear and we're witnessing this and so everyone else has to has to scrape together to do everything we can because of that lack of lack of absence i know this is a half an hour so i'm going to just no, we can go on about this. This is your time and Matt's time to right. kind of talk about how we as a community, because now we know based on what Governor Baker was saying this morning or yesterday, $171 million doesn't seem like a whole lot of money to assist people who are going to be in crisis. It's plugging a hole in a rowboat. So, so Matt, from the city side, what kind of initiatives are we going to be enacting to supplement what the state is doing. Do we have anything concrete at this point? Uh, we have the Summable Cares Fund, which is depleted. Uh, we have the Housing Stability Department, which before this was already working on programs for uh, assistance in rent, uh, particularly for people with Section 8 vouchers. So there are things that could happen, but you know, we, $178 million is, is more than half our budget for the year. Uh, so we don't have the kind of money to protect every tenant in the city. And even the state government uh, doesn't have that much money. So like you said, it's really the federal government that needs to do this. And the problem is, is that, again, this is a national issue and they're delegating it to the states, like you say, which is just a complete abdication of responsibility. Um, and, you know, Kristen mentioned the phrase trickle down, and I was thinking about that phrase because what we really need is a trickle up solution, where if you bailed out the tenants, they can pay the homeowner and the homeowner can pay the bank. But instead, what we have in America is you bail out the bank and then the bank takes the home anyways and they evict the tenant. Uh, so this is the problem. This has existed long before COVID, and now it's just become more serious. And you know, it really kind of surprises me. I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that, you know, we're looking at possible resurgence of, 
resurgence of COVID in the state. Yep. And now they're saying, oh, we're going to end the moratorium. Um, and so the problem I have too, though, is just to be frank with you, is the eviction moratorium will end eventually. Like, there's no way that we can't not have it end at some point. And what we need is financial assistance to people uh, to ensure that they don't get evicted. So the moratorium is just a stopgap measure to prevent massive, massive displacement. But ultimately, we need some sort of financial uh, bailout for the people. And, and may I add to that? I, and exactly, I totally agree with, with what uh, President of the Council, uh, Council McLaughlin, mentioned. And, and I do want to add that we, we still have the eviction moratorium extended. We have an executive order here in Somerville of an eviction moratorium and that there's no extension on, I'm sorry, no deadline on that as of yet. But seeing how we're a municipality, um, we're going to see how that does affect us. And we're going to, this is our litmus test on that and see the strength of that. Uh, we don't know how exactly that's going to affect us as a, as a community, as a city. Do, do either of you know whether or not any of the small property owners or some of the larger rental property owners in the city, do any of you know if they filed suit against the city of Somerville because of our local eviction moratorium? I don't know if that's the case. Uh, and we are aware of lawsuits from small businesses against the city. So as far as I know, that hasn't happened. But if it has happened, you know, it's a statewide policy right now. So they really don't have much, much of a leg to stand on with that. Yeah, I guess I'm worried about, you know, come Saturday when the statewide eviction moratorium lifts, are we prepared for some of the less heart, heart, how do I say this gently? Some of the property owners who don't have a heart are going to start filing suit against the city of Somerville and say, you can't prevent me from evicting these tenants. I mean, that's what I'm really looking for. You know, it could be, it could be nothing, Matt, or it could no. be a tsunami of property owners saying you can't do that. Or it could be a group like small property owners um, who file it as a joint thing. And they might have, they could, they could have a leg to stand on in that situation because one of the things we've talked about a lot is, you know, our city government is very top heavy, uh, very strong their system. And our state government is very top heavy where the cities can do almost nothing without the state's permission. So they could probably find some sort of constitutional argument that, they, that we can't do anything about it, which is again, why we need the state to do something and we need the federal government to do something. It's amazing to me that the CDC has already weighed in on this issue saying that it is absolute insanity to evict people from their homes and put them on the move during a pandemic. That's right. And that the federal government isn't even listening to their own agencies when it comes to this. They're not stepping up to the plate. I mean, you know that and I know that. Kristen, that's something else. It is exposed, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it is exposed blatant incompetency at a federal level. Succinctly said. <laughs> I, and, and I left a little pause there so there would be um, objection to that, but there is no objection from me and I don't think you get any objection from a lot of the listeners today. Let's go into something else. So the evictions, uh, eviction moratorium will stay in place in Somerville. Kudos to um, city council and the mayor. I mean, we're trying to protect people. Um, I don't know why the state thinks it's a good idea to lift theirs. And I don't know why the federal government has been absent in this. Um, let's go into a couple of other things, Matt. Recent city council meetings, anything other than the uh, import of eviction moratorium and helping small businesses. Um, I know that the zoning overlay affordable housing zoning overlay was something Ben Ewan Campen, Councilor Ben Ewan Campen, was talking about at length last week. Any other updates on that? Yeah, well, we're actually having a meeting about that tonight, uh, where we hope to have uh, some sort of a plan to present to the city and the community and have a public hearing on that. Uh, the last meeting we had was actually uh, rather interesting. <laughs> it was a little difficult at time because we passed a, a number of laws and approved uh, a number of budget items, anywhere from 
tree protection to uh, getting rid of the anti-gang ordinance. Uh, so we had a number of roll call votes that day. So all in all, it's good to say that despite COVID and despite everything going on, uh, we are taking care of the day-to-day -day matters as well. Great. Kristen Strezzo, any, any update from your committee member, uh, committees that you chair or a sub-chair? I'm the, the chair of the Housing and Community Development Committee. So our last meeting, we, oh, I, I think we, we have it uh, scheduled. Okay, our last meeting, we were talking about the Tenant Notification Act, which is coupled with uh, in preparation for the eviction moratorium ending, but also uh, thanks to our counselor, uh, was passed last year, uh, what, November 2019? So this was, we talked about enacting it. So what the Tenant Notification Act does, for those who don't know, it it, it is it, anybody that, any, any landlord, um, anywhere that is planning on um, evicting or um, uh, causing a, a, a tenant to leave uh, has to provide the tenant with their rights and uh, options for them and directions they can go. Uh, they must be handed this uh, when this happens. And so this is, a, this is an ordinance in, in the city, so there are uh, fines for it not happening. Uh, tenants have, have to know their rights. And then there, there's also a communication campaign that will be happening, is supposed to happen this month where residents of Somerville will be getting mailing to know that this is an option for them. So it, in, in front of the eviction moratorium, if we know that tenants, we're already hearing from tenants that there, some landlords are trying to push them out, uh, assuming that many people don't know about the eviction moratorium or, or whatnot, or trying to find technicalities or whatnot. So this Tenant Notification Act may help. Uh, there are fines involved, and so that's a lot of the work that uh, the last uh, Housing and Community Development Committee was, was tackling. And Kristen, Kristen, if we do have tenants that are uh, suspecting that they're being unfairly pushed out at this point, what is the resource that the City of Somerville has? It's the Housing Division? That's a that's a great question, um, and it will and all they are prompted to call the um, I to call uh, ISD uh, to report that if it report uh, unfair uh, being forced to leave their um, home or just to know their rights. But also, I would say the first I, I don't have the number at this very second, but I would either make contact with the Office of Housing Stability three one one is the easiest way. But we want to make sure that every department in the city is well aware of the situation. So if a tenant does call 311 or does call ISD, that they're not, oh, gee, I haven't heard of that. Or oh, I don't know, let me, eh, I don't know, uh, please hold. Uh, I don't know, have you heard of this? No, you haven't. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Call back later. But there will be a website set up. There is mailings, our mailings coming out. And that's a first step. But ISD will be ready and prepared as is Office of Housing Stability, which is already ready. Um, and I just, I, I wanted to make something clear, and either one can weigh in on this, um, that this, you know, the protections that's, that is out there doesn't strip the landlord of all of their rights. Because if you have a tenant who, uh, I, you know, give me, I'll give you the worst case scenario, a tenant who purposely sets fire to the apartment, I mean, these eviction moratoriums are not going to protect that person. Correct and right and 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 this and this isn't just about benevolency. This is about right. There's there's no like loss of accountability behavior. But the the point is we know that uh, this is a multifaceted issue. And and the goal is is of course information. And and the first part of the Tenant Notification Act is that if it, there's there's a there's a, a free pass. So if if a a tenant I'm sorry if a landlord didn't know about the, the ordinance, there's a, a pass that there's the first uh, violation of that is free, it's nothing. Uh, then from there, it's if they want, once we know that they know they're aware of it, well, that's a different story. One of the things that, that was not addressed, and uh, as you both know, there are, I'm, I do another thing here in the city, is protection for the small businesses when it comes to their commercial properties, because we've been talking a lot about residential tenant protection. 
do, do uh, Matt or Kristen, how, how does this eviction moratorium affect the small business and commercial properties? It was basically the same as um, going to be a real problem for them. And a lot of the small businesses in the city do not own the property that they operate out of. Um, and the, the, I'd say the majority of businesses and it just goes into a much larger issue where a lot of the property in the city is owned by a very small group of people, which is why we have a lot of vacant properties in the city, uh, which is why people are going to get evicted uh, in this situation, almost regardless of what happens. And the problem we have here is, you know, people, we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of tenant protections in the state but ultimately the property owner wins because they have, it's their land and the, the most you can do is delay the process uh, before they get what they want. So this is a major problem. And the, again, the only solution that I see is a bailout for small businesses and for regular people, for tenants, which will eventually take care of everything. If you, if you give these people the resources to pay their rent, it will go to the landowner, which in turn will go to the banks. And that's the only solution we really have. So I would encourage people to vote in November. And I, hope, I can only hope that we have a government that is going to take this seriously and provide a bailout for the people instead of large businesses. Well, let's, I, I hate bouncing back and forth, but this new zoning overlay, the affordable housing overlay, intrigues me that um, the the developers of these new buildings these new style you know affordable housing buildings wouldn't they be under the same financial pressure as a private building developer in terms of collecting rents and providing housing for less affluent people what i'm trying to get at is i'm seeing a movement that the affordable housing overlay would provide incentive for these affordable housing developers to go much higher and increase the density in those buildings uh, versus a private developer. For, it's kind of a quid pro quo. You give us more affordable housing, we'll allow you more units. But what I'm trying to get at but for both counselors, they also have financial constraints they also need to have income coming in for those buildings. How does that work for an eviction moratorium? I mean, I, I guess I'm confused as to, uh, Councilor McLaughlin, take it away. Yeah, well, I'll tell you that um, it is a benefit. The, the affordable housing overlay, the only thing it will do is allow affordable housing to get built. Right now, it's all, we're talking about 100% affordable housing units. And all it does was basically remove some of the barriers uh, so that if someone doesn't like the affordable housing next to their house, they can't just sue and delay it for several years. So that's basically all it is right now. Uh, in terms of tenant protections in affordable housing, there's already a number of laws and restrictions on affordable housing units that would make it way more difficult to evict someone in affordable housing than a private building. Uh, so those laws already exist. People do get evicted sometimes, but there has to be incredible circumstances and just um, that's less of a concern to me. And, and what it is, is all this is right now is allowing affordable housing to get built without some of the barriers that come with it. Right. And, and, and with that, Joe and, and Matt, I, I think at this point right here in this point of history and time, we're all hypothesizing. We don't know what's, none of us know what's going to happen Saturday. None of us know what the climate for building uh, anything will look like next year. We have no idea when we will get this pandemic under wraps. Hopefully soon. We don't know anything as of yet. We can't predict anything. We can hope. But I don't think we're anywhere clear. Who knows? Well, I mean, that's, you know, again, it goes back to when people of this municipality look to the government, whether it's local, state or federal, I, I would have to say that they're getting more answers and they're getting more action out of the local authorities at this point than they are out of the state and the feds. Um, you know, I watched the city council, Councilor White makes fun of me. He says, 
well, how can you sit through those council meetings? <laughs> Primarily because I want to understand what the council is doing locally. Um, because I, I, you know, I follow a lot of local governments and I, I'm a firm believer that you start where, where you live. So we live in this municipality, we elect people to the city council, we elect people to the school committee and we elect a mayor and we look to them to do the best job they can. The problem comes in though, you guys are doing a yeoman's work in trying to help people. Then you move up a level to the state and Charlie Baker doesn't have 351 communities in Massachusetts that look like us. So he's trying to balance that across all municipalities. And then you have the federal government who is stuck like a fly on Mike Pence's head. You know, it just, you can't move it without a fly swatter. And I think, Matt, what you're saying is November 3rd could be the fly swatter for the United States. You know, just get out there and vote. If you're dissatisfied with what's happening in this country, in this state, in this city, there is a way to turn that on its head and get rid of the fly. So Adam's given me the, the timing, the signal here. I want to close out. I can see Councillor Crezzo. <laughs> Councillor Strezzo, you are just <laughs> loving that one. So, Matt and Kristen, anything else you want to say before we close out? Well, Joe, in case you need me for the sound bite, November <laughs> 3rd is the fly swatter for the United States. <laughs> Kristen. I can't. I can't follow that act. I'm sorry. <laughs> I leave you both with that. Thank you so much for joining us on Somerville Media Center Live. I'm Joe Lynch. Please stay safe, stay informed, and get your fly swatter ready. <laughs>